Hello, I am Somendra Patnaik. I teach anthropology at the University of Delhi. And in this module, I am going to discuss with you about how anthropological theories emerged in its first place. The whole paper would deal with varieties of anthropological theories, but in this module, I am going to tell you the major theories and how it came into existence. It is important to know that in any discipline, the most important part for grounding of the discipline is theory and the methods. There is an interface between theory and methods in such a significant way that each reinforce each other in terms of its modification, in terms of its upward uh, unfolding. And unless we keep revising our theories and unless we keep revising our methods, no subject can grow in its entirety. So, let us first identify what is a theory. I mean, to which set of ideas do we call a theory? A theory is a body of knowledge, if I am allowed to explain you in a very simplified manner. It is a body of knowledge or it is a set of propositions, set of ideas, set of postulates explaining the nature of society, nature of culture or explaining nature of human behavior, human relationships. And what are these postulates all about? These postulates are about how a society should be understood, how a culture should be taken into account or considered, or how human behavior can provide meaning in understanding human relationships. So, it is a kind of heuristic scheme or a kind of blueprint which has its own concepts, which has its own ideas. And these ideas and these blueprints are put together for giving rise to a set of propositions or a grand proposition which we call as theory. Now, what are concepts? Concepts are actually analytical categories or analytical tools by using which we can explain a variety of social phenomena. What is the concept of marriage in different societies? What is the concept of family in different societies? What is the concept of ancestors in, in different cultures? Or what is the concept of, let us say, a good living, a good human being? So, these are cultural concepts. And these cultural concepts, when put together, they, they, they get weaved into a particular grand design. And that grand design takes the shape of a theory. Let me put it in the other way. When we talk about a theory, we are talking about a set of mental constructs. And these mental constructs are logically related to one another in such a way that this logical relationship gives rise to a set of propositions, a set of explanations. And these explanations or propositions are usually universally valid or in a limited scale, if we call it as a middle range theory, they are valid in a limited manner or they are culture specific. So, at this juncture, it is important to know what are the ingredients of a theory or what are the elements of a theory. Now, theory tries to answer, number one element would be, theory tries to answer certain basic questions. And to answer those basic questions, it relies on certain kind of assumptions. It assumes certain things. It does not it doesn't accept those things in the first place. It assumes certain things. And after assuming those things, it looks for its verification. And wh when we look for its verification, we have to follow certain methods for collecting the verifications. So, if the first one is question, the second one is the assumption, and third one is the method for verifying it or method for collecting which is the fourth one is the evidence that what are the evidences that gives rise to this kind of theory. So, when we look into the methods of collecting theoretical uh, propositions or methods of verifying theoretical propositions, there are two broad methods which logic or philosophy has taught us and anthropology is very closely connected to, uh, to, to logic or to philosophy. So, one method is inductive method and the other method is deductive method. When we talk about inductive method, we move from particular to general. We observe instance 1 or situation 1, we observe situation 2 
or another situation and from there we move to a, a, a final situation where we can generalize or we can theorize. So from particular to general is inductive logic or the, the other one, the deductive logic is when you move from general to particular. For example, we, we first propose a statement and after proposing that the statement like sun rises in the, in the east and then we try to verify it every day and then we, we come to the conclusion that yes, sun rises in the, in the east. So that kind of generalization and verifications are deductive generalizations. We first perceive the whole and this whole is perceived in terms of if or, uh, or, 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 or uh, suppose this is the case and then there are different mechanisms of verification. So depending on what mechanism we adopt to, to generalize, we are choosing between inductive logic or deductive logic. Now, after having said this, that there are different forms of logic, different ways of going about generalization, it is important to know how these kind of logics came up in the discipline of anthropology. And on what basis that we can say that we have become inductively logical or deductively logical. But the first question comes here is, anthropological generalizations could be based on existing theories, inferences from ethnographic records or previously known possibilities. It could be an induction based upon observations and generally it leads to theory building. But theory building is a continuous process. The logic of induction and deduction, the logic continuously gives rise to new kinds of adjustment to the existing theory. And these new adjustment comes from a fresh interpretation of facts on the basis of empirical findings. Was anthropology logical right from the beginning? And, and, and it's a very important question to be answered when we talk about the theory because anthropology first began in the writings of colonizers, colonial administrators, missionaries and travelers from the western country and they came to, to non-western countries like Africa, uh, Australia or India. And when these colonizers were writing about the non-western other, there was hardly any logic or a, a kind of logic which was there which mainly helped them to propagate their racial and cultural superiority. Something which we call in anthropology as, as colonial bias or as, as ethnocentrism that we, I mean those, the practitioners of the discipline during that point of time, I'm talking about 1840s, 1850s or even uh, late 1800s, 1870s and 80s. During this time, they were mainly practicing a kind of intellectual exercise where cultural oddities like something which were, which were strikingly different from the non-Western cultures like head hunting, cannibalism, polyandry, dormitory, sexual laxity of the local communities, they were emphasized in such a manner that they, dif they look different from the non-Western culture. In terms of race, language, culture, the Orient or the non-Western other is painted in inferior color. And this was the kind of monographs or the studies which anthropology witnessed in the beginning. And, and many a times we still carry the criticism that anthropology is carrying out the colonial legacy, but, but most of, in most cases, either it is Indian anthropology or different, different uh, national anthropologies from the global south, they are trying to uh, demystify this colonial legacy and they are trying to develop some kind of, some kind of indigenous anthropology or some kind of indigenous theory and about which we shall discuss later on that how indigeneity has contributed to the understanding of the theory or understanding of the society and culture. Between 1850 and 1920, an important theory took place in anthropology and it was inspired by the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species in 1858. And even before the publication of this book, Hubbard Spencer talked about the idea of social evolution. But in any case, this publication and also Hubbard Spencer's book clearly revealed an important uh, area of inquiry that anthropology started studying how these social institutions came up, how marriage came up, how family came up, how religion came up. 
and they wanted to study the evolution of the social institutions of the pre-literate societies and ironically these societies never had any written history. So this was a major drawback in propounding the theory of social evolution or cultural evolution because they never had any evidence of written history. So the theory came to be known as highly conjectural, highly speculative and highly selective in terms of its evidences. They selected only those evidences which proved the design which they had already conceived. So many of the anthropologists said that it is like once I wear a horse theory or as if something which has been conceived first and the evidences are put later on. So this is, this is one kind of theoretical development which we call as evolutionism in anthropology. And parallel to evolutionism came up another theory called diffusionism. What they studied in diffusionism that how culture traits, cultural practices, cultural customs and, and traditions got diffused across the culture. It could be possible due to migration, it could be possible due to diffusion. Migration is when the people moved from one territory to another territory and carried the culture traits with them and diffusion is when the people did not move but the culture traits moved from one area to another area. <clears throat> Both the theory of diffusion and evolution did not have any substantial evidence to prove that they were correct and they were having a great sense of uh, history. They were interested in the history of these community but actually there was no history available. It was all, only the oral history. So a major criticism came up against these two theories evolutionism and diffusionism that they were highly conjectural, they were speculative and they were not scientific. So when did the scientific temper came? in anthropological theories. It could be attributed to 1920s around that time due to the work of two of the important scholars, one Bronislaw Kasper Malinowski and the other one Redcliffe Brown. Both of them tried to establish anthropology as an empirical science. They tried to bring in a new kind of method. They tried to bring in new kind of evidences to be studied. They tried to bring in new kinds of concepts to be weaved together to give rise to a theory. Let us see what are the concepts they tried to bring and why these concepts were important for understanding anthropological theory. If I talk about Redcliffe Brown, Redcliffe Brown was concerned with the phenomena that culture is so variable, so diverse, so diffuse or so, what should I say, it is so, uh, so broad range, it is important to know that how can we arrive at some concept which are comparable. So he came up with a concept called social structure. Social structure is, uh, is a mode of arrangement or a network of relationship among actually existing individuals, a concrete network and how this network can be understood in terms of interpersonal relationship, how it can be understood in terms of, in terms of intergroup relationships. But Redcliffe Brown was primarily interested in studying the interpersonal relationship, the dyadic relationship that is giving rise to social structure. He believed that once we study social structure, it facilitates comparison. It is a very important point in scientific inquiry that unless we compare society A with society B and society B with society C, we cannot generalize. Comparison was regarded as a precondition for generalization and generalization is regarded as a precondition for giving rise to the law. Law generation is possible only through comparison and only through generalization and this was the hallmark of anthropological inquiry. Anthropologists started studying the social structure of society A, moved on to the study of social structure of society B and then to society C to arrive at generalizations and therefore it was it was trying to acquire a scientific basis of generalization. Little Brown even went up to the extent of calling that social anthropology is the natural science of society. And such a grand statement that social anthropology is nothing but a natural science of society, on what basis did he talk about this? He, 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 he believed that this is something which is making anthropology empirical. This, this anthropology is 
being grounded on the field work tradition a tradition which malinowski was given the credit for starting it a tradition where anthropology has developed a method of doing field work they go to the local community they stay with them they learn their language they learn their local categories their cognitive categories their metaphors their narratives they they live like them they think like them and therefore they come up with the view from within a perspective which we call in anthropology as emic perspective so emic perspective is important because it helps later on the planners the administrators to understand but we are not going into the details of that or the relevance of emic perspective but what is important here is that we go or anthropologists go and study the local communities by staying there by living with them and this has brought out an empirical tradition a tradition which is strictly grounded in some kind of existentialism in some kind of actual existing of the societies and that is possible through the study of field work but what do we do in field work in field work what can we observe we don't observe human mind we don't observe what people think we observe what people do we observe how people carry out their behavior how people carry out their relationship and i after studying what people do and how people carry out their activities we infer we abstract or we derive some sort of relationship some kind of rela rel relational dimension that that could emerge from the actual behavior and then we see how these relational dimensions can be put together to give rise to the social structure and this was the contribution of retl brown that understanding of the social structure is a sum total of interpersonal dyadic relationship in form of a network and what was malinowski's contribution in developing this kind of theory he believed that all the individuals are biopsychic in nature and therefore their needs need to be satisfied and the need satisfaction is done by the culture culture is a vast apparatus which satisfies the human needs and therefore culture is functional culture is important for the living of the individual for the life of the individual because it satisfies the basic needs which are biopsychic in nature when we talk about the need satisfaction of the role of the culture and the interpersonal dyadic social relationships we are putting both the theories together theory of structure and theory of function giving rise to structure functionalism which claimed a scientific status for anthropology so this is regarded as a march of anthropological theory in the path of science or trying to make anthropology a scientific venture and that and therefore the modern anthropology could be said to have began from 1920s onward with the publication of two important monographs one by malinowski and the other one by retl brown uh, argonauts of western pacific by bronislaw malinowski and the andaman islanders by retl brown both appeared in 1922 this is all about how anthropological theory was emerging in united kingdom this is popularly known as the british school and parallel to this there was another intellectual tradition which was taking shape in france in the writings of levistras levistras was writing in uh, in french in late 40s and even in early early 40s but towards early 60s his work got translated into english and it influenced the wider world only from early 60s what levistras had to offer in terms of theoretical contribution to anthropology levistras argued that unless we understand the the way human mind perceives things it is not going to be possible on our part to explain the social phenomena britishers or the british social anthropologists were more interested in studying the human behavior and the french tradition was more interested in knowing how human mind carried out its own activities the french anthropologists were more inspired by a linguistic uh, tradition which was called as structural linguistics and structural linguistics gave utmost importance to why similar sounding words with slight difference talk about entirely different meaning 
लेटस एग्जाम्पल टू हिंदी वर्ड्स संसार एंड समसान संसार टॉक्स अबाउट द वर्ल्ड द वर्ल्ड मैटर्स एंड समसान टॉक्स अबाउट एंड ऑफ इट नाउ इट इज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टू नो इवन इन द इंग्लिश लैंग्वेज देर आर वर्ड्स विच आर क्लोजली रिलेटेड इन टर्म्स ऑफ साउंड वैल्यू बट इन टर्म्स ऑफ मीनिंग दे आर एंटायरली डिफरेंट सो दे आर ग्यूड दैट ह्यूमन माइंड इज मोर कंफर्टेबल और ह्यूमन माइंड इज ट्रेन टू परसीव थिंग्स इन बाइनरी कंट्रास्ट so binary contrast became one of the important principles for understanding human mind they examined things like the binarity between raw and cooked they examined things like left and right men and women and 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 things like uh, like mask and faces and all these things were examined just to understand how kinship marriage or uh, uh, myth culinary skills they all have come up over period of time and in the whole process the the argument of french tradition was that it is a middle path it is a method but it is neither scientific nor humanities and it is interesting to know how it offers a middle path it is a middle path because it believes that there is a universal rule to study human mind and that rule is the rule of binarity but at the same time it talks about the binarity of human mind which itself is a component of humanities or which is a component of 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 let us say uh, uh, beyond beyond uh, scientific uh, uh, scientific manifestation that, that there is more of psychology there is more of understanding there is more of meaning but this meaning this psychology this understanding has a uniform principle and that is the uniform principle of binarity that it understands things in binary opposition so after french uh, school of thought you come across an attempt by the post structuralist and the post structuralist like bourdieu and even foucault they all believe that how one can synthesize the objective phenomena with that of a subjectivity or how one can confluence the objectivity with that of subjectivity and very important component of objectivity and subjectivity is how to understand body and mind body is an essentially objective phenomena and mind is essentially a subjective phenomena so post structuralist have tried to come up with theoretical concepts with theoretical postulates which explains how mind body and cultural values could be put together and that is popularly known as theory of practice by bourdieu where he has come up with concepts like habitus doxa and field which are all related to one another various concepts related to one another in terms of a theory of practice that how in human body or on the human body how there are social rules operating and how social rules are operating in such a way that it conditions our manner of sitting our manner of talking our manner of walking which bourdieu calls it as habitus and habitus is located in a field socially relevant field or or social field where there are differential uh, forces of power intersecting with one another and differential location of the individual in the power hierarchy and and in 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 this condition of differential location of power hierarchy the personal ambition or the 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 motive to move up is conditioned by the field that is what called as doxa that many of us generally feel that it is not my cup of tea so doxa inhibits the social mobility and why i am trying to tell you all this theory at this point of time is to know how to to convey you the idea that how various concepts can be put together to give rise to a particular kind of theoretical formulation or a particular kind of theoretical postulation and theory of practice is a one of the best examples where various fields various concepts can be put together in terms of a particular kind of orientation while structuralism was taking shape in the intellectual traditions of france there was another intellectual tradition coming up with the writings of american anthropologist 
and this tradition was known as new ethnography now in new ethnography they believed that every culture has its own logic every culture has its own grammar and every culture is like a logico mathematical system now how to arrive at this logico mathematical system of every culture this is possible only by understanding the folk classifications the classification people make about things around them about relationships around them about the natural objects like land climate seasons animals how do they classify and what are the what are the terminologies they have come up with to explain these kind of differences folk classification and understanding of the local cognitive categories became the hallmark of anthropological inquiry in early 60s and this this has led to mainly reliance on metaphors and narratives metaphors are allegories or comparisons which people give to explain something and narratives are detailed descriptions of connected happenings these metaphors and narratives became crucial evidences for building the cultural cognition for building the cultural grammar now what is the difference between structuralism which came up in france and new ethnography or cognitive anthropology or uh, ethno science which came up in america the difference is if structuralism believed in a universal cultural grammar based on the binarity of human thinking binary functioning of human mind new ethnography believed that there is no single logic of culture every culture has its own logic and differential logic and all these differences should be studied through this new ethnographic method and new ethnography differed from the classical ethnography of retley brown and malinowski on the ground that they studied behavior and new ethnographers study human thoughts or human thinking but they believed in multiple grammars and french tradition believed in a singular logic the singular principle of binarity now after the new ethnography came up there are revealing or there are interesting debates or interesting theoretical unfolding which came up in uh, in in in, in uh, anthropology there are two traditions one the post structural tradition in france and and uh, remaining part of the world and there is a another literary tradition which came up in the writings of uh, clifford geertz is post modernism so when we talk about the post structural tradition we mainly find out how there is an attempt to synthesize the objectivity with subjectivity how there is a need to synthesize the manner in which body is understood and the manner in which mind is understood but when it comes to the post modernism in in anthropology it's an entirely interesting field because post modernism is a realization that there is no singular theory which can explain the social phenomena more accurately truth is not singular truth is plural and truth is possible only or our construction of the truth is possible by variety of ways by varieties of scholars and most important realization in post modernism was that most of the anthropological theories or theories in social science came up during a particular period of uh, intellectual history or came up in a particular uh, reason of the western society so it was mainly critiquing that how the initial theories were formed by an a, a group of elite intellectuals a group who dominated the 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 way in which social science thinking was oriented but post modernism challenged all these kind of practices which has consolidated theory building in anthropology or in any other subject so what was their contribution contribution of post modernism was that anthropology cannot be pursued in a uniform way in a uniform manner following one or other particular theory theoretical formulations are multiple theoretical uh, possibilities are plural and therefore we cannot just be accurate about how an interpersonal relationship should be oriented in a given culture 
because when you are studying how an interpersonal relationship is ori oriented in a given culture, we are giving importance to a singular voice. And this singularity of social voice is something which postmodern scholars are critiquing. They believe that within a community, there are multiple voices. Within a culture, there are multiple voices. There are multiple feelings. There are multiple aspirations. And as anthropologists, you need to capture these kind of voices, these kind of aspirations in your theoretical understanding or in your empirical investigations. Finally, we can say that no theory ever dies out. The theories keep changing, new ideas come up and new ideas get articulated into the existing theories. Let us see how whole idea of anthropological theory emerged. It basically emerged in 17th century enlightenment period where Montesquieu's idea of social contract and other kinds of uh, uh, enlightened ideas influenced the understanding of human society. And the actual foundation of anthropological theory started around 19th century. And uh, it, it, it is understood that uh, the first theory, evolutionism, has uh, been uh, criticized for being conjectural or for being speculative. But later on, around 1950s, a group of scholars felt that there is nothing wrong with the idea of evolution. What was wrong was the units of study which the predecessors took. Instead of taking the cultural institutions as the units of study, they took more cultural neutral institutions like technology, time, energy, and found out the notion of progress, the notion of uh, 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 development through these kind of mechanisms. So you can say that evolutionism has given rise to neo-evolutionism, within which ideas pertaining to progress, technology, and development could be examined fresh. Similarly, the theory of diffusionism may become obsolete. But look, in the new system of global uh, forces or in the new, new, new period of globalization, new era of globalization, how the circulation of goods take place between what is called as universal or, or global and what is called as local or circulation of goods between various spaces is becoming more important, is a, becoming a phenomena worth studying. Diffusionism has also given rise to regional studies, that how a culture grows within a given region or within a particular region. So similarly, towards the end of diffusionism, we find the whole idea of cultural relativism coming up very prominently in the writings of Franz Boas, that no culture is superior or inferior in relation to another culture, and therefore it should be studied in relation to itself. Now, cultural relativism might become a very fascinating idea, but you can see that this is also being critiqued or this is also being re-looked when we talk about ideas like reflexivity, ideas like, like um, subjectivities, or when we are critiquing the whole idea of, of value neutrality that is value neutrality a possibility or we have to continuously try to overcome it? Is it possible? Is it desirable? I mean, at what level we are going to handle these subjective feelings? When I say that cultural relativism is uh, something which is being revisited, I'm talking about reflexivity, that how reflexivity is becoming an important component of anthropological theory. When we come to study structure, structure functionalism, the British tradition, when we find that within the British tradition, what was emphasized was the norm, what was emphasized was a kind of system of equilibrium, a, a harmonic system of equilibrium, or uh, a, a system which exists in perfect harmony with one another. We also talk about questions like change. We talk about questions like inner dynamism. When we talk about processes, social processes, it is not a normative structure. There are also processes. So the critiques of British stru structure functionalism has also opened up new vistas to study social processes, interactionism, and new kinds of theoretical postulates. 
when we talk about uh, structuralism structuralism is also giving rise to post structuralist ideas where marxism is being interpreted in a new way where uh, where uh, the new kinds of critical theories are coming up in a very significant way and finally when we come about uh, post modernism we find that post modernism is giving rise to new kinds of understanding of the truth like is truth singular if truth is singular is it a is it understood through a male lens is it understood through a patriarchal lens or how gender is contributing for understanding of the truth truth for whom how subjectivities are contained in the interpretation of the truth truth so feminist theories feminist anthropology and gender studies are coming up in a very critical way and in addition to the gender studies we are also talking about theories like marxist anthropologist and Ma marxist theories which are coming in a significant way to supplement each other when we talk about critical theory finally i would like to say that evolution of a particular theory or unfolding of a particular theory is deeply connected to the national tradition or a nationalistic tradition anthropology emerged in one way theoretical anthropology emerged in one way in uh, british tradition it emerged in another way in french tradition and it still emerged in another way in the german tradition so following the traditions of of united kingdom germany and the france we come across different kind of anthropology and different kind of theoretical flavor now it is very important to know whether in india it has been able to generate a theoretical concern or a theoretical point of view of its own it's important to note here that in india most of the classical ethnographies were done earlier before 1910 it was done by the british scholar administrators but a significant publication took place in 1912 the mundas in their country by s c roy and in the same year l k anantakrishna iyer published his monograph on castes of cochin and travancore and this was the period when indian anthropology was trying to theorize itself but not necessarily in terms of a tribal studies and when you look into the indian scenario you will find that 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 there are there are two different schools one school believes that indian society can be theorized on the basis of the available books on the basis of indological sources and the other indian tradition believes that indian society could be understood through empirical tradition through field work or through a, a a understanding of the context so two distinct theoretical traditions in india one coming from the book and the other one coming from the field talks about the book view and field view of indian society and later on many concepts came up concepts like sanskritization westernization politicization hinduization which have contributed significantly to the theoretical conceptualization of indian society and later on many scholars have given the concept of sec uh, sacred complex nature main spirit complex and all of them have contributed immensely to the theoretical growth and development of anthropology in india and therefore indian anthropology is growing not in isolation in itself but it is growing in relation to the world anthropology as a whole and there are it has been responsive important it, it has been responsive in a very important and significant way to the growth of uh, for international uh, traditions of anthropology as i have told you earlier that there are various elements of the theory the questions the assumptions the evidence and the methods if we look into the way the discipline emerged we found that there were there have been many questions different questions bothering the discipline bothering the disciplinary practitioners and which they have been searching to find an answer now the first answer was or the first question was that how social institutions evolved and evolution was a kind of meta narrative parallel to this came up the question of diffusion how culture traits 
diffused from one area to another area and both these questions had some historical concerns. Without a sense of history, these questions could not have been answered. But when anthropologists realized that it is very difficult to reconstruct the history of the preliterate communities or communities without any skill for writing, they changed their orientation, they changed their question. They thought that it is interesting to find out the contemporary questions like how societies and culture function at a particular point of view or at a particular point of time, how societies and culture orient themselves with, with, with the whole idea of uh, giving uh, need satisfaction to the individuals or what is the contemporaneity of human diversity. So they were not very much historical, they were more towards the comparative understanding of the humanity. They tried to find out what could be the law, is there any law? So anthropology was moving from conjecture to a science which can give law or which can generate some kind of law. Questions are changing, the, the, the search is changing and, and the methods are also changing. If the earlier school of thoughts like diffusionism and evolutionism, they use some kind of history, the structure functionalism never used any sense of history. And if structure functionalism talked about strict empirical study or study of the behavior, the new ethnography came up with a new set of questions. What were the questions that we must understand the folk classification, the local logic, the cultural logic and similarly the structuralism also came up with another set of questions. The question was how human mind carries out its activities. So with the change of questions, there has been change of methods and there has been different kind of evidences which we have been talking of. Sometimes we are talking of evidences based on behavioral data, sometimes we talk about evidences based on cognitive data, evidences based on symbolic data and sometimes we are talking of evidences which are multiple, which are contested the way we talk about the evidences in postmodernism. So the questions are changing, the methods are changing, the evidences are changing, but what remains perpetual or what remains eternal is a search for the understanding of humanity and the, a, a comparative search where the voices get articulated more meaningfully, the voices of men, the voices of women, the voices of Dalits, the voices of marginal, the voices of disabled and the voices of minority and that gives us an edge over other disciplines to talk about Indian society in its diversity, Indian society in its plurality, not being biased by one or other section but being inspired by a discipline which has developed its own methods, which has developed its own theory and this one of the important methods which anthropology has developed is the method of ethnography to reach out the other, to arrive at an understanding of the emic point of view, the other's perspective which is so important in the contemporary national life to, to formulate national policy, to deal with development issues, to deal with issues pertaining to poor, excluded, marginalized, oppressed.